Good evening. Welcome to Optus Nikon webinar, See Wider, Capture More, Improve the Clinical Decisions Using Peripheral OCT. We really appreciate giving us your precious time. Uh, first, let me introduce myself. I am Mizuki Ako, sales representative at Nikon Corporation. I will be the moderator of today's webinar. Before I introduce our guest speakers, I would like to tell you that this webinar is being recorded. All attendees are in mute mode, but there is a question function in your control panel which will allow you to ask a question. Those questions would be answered by each speaker. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our two guest speakers today who are going to talk us about the clinical experience and the utility of ultra wide field imaging and the peripheral OCT silverstone. I would like to introduce the two presenters, so Dr. Kusaka and Dr. Chowdhury, please turn on your video. Dr. Kusaka is a professor and the chair of Kinda University Faculty of Medicine in Japan. Dr. Kusaka, please say hi to audience. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. And Dr. Chowdhury is a medical director of the Vitreous Retina Macular Specialist of Toronto in Canada. Dr. Chowdhury, please say hi to the audience. Hello, everyone. Looking forward to sharing my presentation with you. Thank you. As a first section of today, please let me share a basic introduction of Silverstone. Good evening, everyone. My name is Mizuki Wako, and I'm sales representative at Nikon Corporation. Today, I would like to talk to you about product information of Silverstone. Since we launched the Silverstone at AAO in 2019, many ophthalmologists has been enjoying the world's first ultra-wide field retina imaging device with integrated self-to-source OCT. We would like to give a brief introduction how it can provide various benefits to your research and daily practices. There are two benefits of ultra-wide field imaging and four benefits of OCT imaging. Optus is the only product which can provide ultra-wide field retina imaging with single shot. And the Silverstone has various retina imaging modalities. With swept source OCT, the scan speed is faster, signal goes to deeper to choroid, and you can see the clear visibility even if patients have cataracts, vitreous cloud, or blood. The widest scan is 23 mm which can be selected scan area from superior to inferior on the ultra-wide field image. In addition, we believe this benefit is the most attractive feature of this product. You can select the scan area and capture OCT scan anywhere on the 200-degree ultra-wide field image. We would like to show three minutes short movie before moving to presentations of our guest speakers. We believe this video will help you to understand general flow of operation. Optima parallel image will be captured first before starting OCT unless it's already captured. Once the color image is captured, select the desired OCT from menu on the bottom right of the corner. Before showing OCT capturing steps, 
B will explain scan types of silver stone. Top four scan types are for Central Pole region. Bottom four scan types for peripheral area. Now we show the OCT capturing steps. You can drop UWF extended line from superior to inferior area on the marked box. Once the scan area is placed to appropriate position, press the capture the button to begin OCT optimization. Distract the patient to look at the eye target and blink normally. Once the OCT optimization is completed, ask the patient to blink open both eye wider for the OCT scan. Click the capturing button to capture OCT image. Tap Accept to save the image. Now we would like to show the OCT UWF line scan. You can drop UWF line scan anywhere on the Optimap and take same step as UWF extended line. You can also drop UWF volume scan anywhere on the Optimap and take same steps as explained previously. You can see and edit all captured images on Optima Optus Advance. These are example image which captured by Silverstone. And now, I would like to move to presentations by our guest speakers. You will have the opportunity to submit questions to presenters by typing your question into the QA box on the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these questions, and the presenter will answer questions after each presentation. I would like to introduce Dr. Aksaka as our first presenter. Dr. Aksaka, please turn on the video. Dr. Aksaka is a professor and the chair of Kinda University Faculty of Medicine, also a board member of Japanese Retina and Veterans Society. His research interests include the treatment of various vitro retinal disorders, especially pediatric retinal diseases. Dr. Aksaka will give us a presentation, Clinical Experience of Ultra-Wide Field Fundus Camera with Ultra-Wide OCT. So please join me welcoming Dr. Aksaka. Dr. Aksaka, please introduce yourself. Yes, thank you very much for kind introduction. I'm Shunji Aksaka from Osaka, Japan, uh, Kinda University, uh, located in the south part of Japan, uh, Osaka, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm going to talk about today my uh, experience of silver stone. Although it was a short period, but I found it's an amazing machine. So please uh, turn on my video, please. Hello, I'm Shunji Kusaka, a retina specialist at Kinda University, Osaka, Japan. I'd like to talk about today my clinical experience of silver stone at our institute. Let me introduce a bit about Kinda University, which is in the south part of Osaka, a second largest city in Japan, with a population of 8.8 .8 million. Optos was founded by Mr. Anderson in 1992. His son, Rafe, went brandless, unfortunately, because of late diagnosis of retinal detachment at the age of five. As you know, it is sometimes difficult to examine the fundus of a five-year-old child. Mr. Anderson then decided to develop a special type of fundus camera, which photographs rotor-wide field fundus in one shot, 
which should be able to detect pathology located in the peripheral retina, even in young children. In 2015, Nikon acquired Optos. In 2017, we have purchased California. However, as the doctors in our department wanted to take Optos Fundus photographs, probably too much, our technicians strongly desired for another Optos camera. This is because many patients had to wait for a long time for Fundus camera examination. In 2019, we have purchased another Optos machine, Daytona, to solve this problem. We had a chance to use Silverstone, which became commercially available April last year in Japan. Silverstone is, in short, combination of Optos and swept source OCT. By Optus California, Cara, Red Free, Colloidal, Autofluorescence, FA, and IA images can be acquired. In addition to these capabilities, SSOCT images can be taken by Silverstone. Let me explain eight patterns of OCT scans. First four patterns are for posterior retina. Line scan is with 40 mm width in the horizontal direction. Up to 25 images can be averaged to improve image quality. The rest are volume scans. Raster scan is with 14 by 9 mm and 121 scans. Retina scan is with 9 by 9 mm with 111 scans. ONH scan is for optic nerve head, uh, 6 by 6 mm with uh, 111 scans. I personally prefer raster scan as it covers wide field without loss of important findings. Of course, you can scan the retina where you want to check, like line or areas shown in pink. Next, regarding the scans for the peripheral retina, there are four patterns. The left is UWF, which is rotor wide field, line scan with 6 mm wide. The second to the left is UWF, volume scan with 6 by 6 mm. The third to the left is UWF, HD volume scan with 6 by 3.5 mm, by which image of higher resolution can be obtained. The light is UWF extended line scan with 23 meter wide. Very impressive. Wide field images can be obtained using this scan mode. I'd like to explain the method of acquiring OCT images. First, ask the patient to look at the fixation target, then press opt map to acquire from this image. Next, press OCT, then select OCT scan mode. All procedures are easily done on the touch panel very quickly. In the U WF extended line scan mode, after choosing that mode, only the central part of the retina becomes bright, as you can see on the left panel, showing the area where the scan is possible. Then determine where to scan and optimize the eye positioning. After optimization, scan is started. After scanning Fundus image, OCT scan and SRO images are shown in one picture, like this. It is important to check the SRO image if the scan is where you want to observe. If you wish, you can change the magnification of Fundus image, like this. I personally prefer this magnified Fundus image as it is apparently easier to check the fundus view. 
If the OCT image looks like this in UWF scan, you can configure the image uh, like this. In addition, you can observe bilateral images in one picture like this. This is convenient and quick way to compare the right and left eyes. Using volume scan mode, you can observe OCT images in animation, in which you have less chance of missing some important findings. For example, this is a patient with high myopia and choroidal neovascularization. If you use line mode, you may miss the CNV. However, using volume scan, in this case, Laster scan, CNV could easily be identified. This is a case with chronic VKH disease, which is Foktokoyanagi Harada disease. You can observe wide area of choroidal atrophy, especially in the peripheral retina. In the other case of VKH disease, the choroidal is also thin. In this case, posterior vitreous is clearly visible. This is a patient with floaters. You can observe the posterior vitreous very clearly. As you can see here, the vitreous is still adherent to the disc and the fovea. This is a patient with proliferative diabetic retinopathy. In the right eye, fibrovascular membrane is present in the lower retina, and raster scan was performed. In the raster scan at fibrovascular membrane, PVD is observed in the posterior part. However, in the peripheral retina, PVD is not present. This kind of information is important when you perform vitrectomy for this eye. This is the case of post-laser abrasion for retinal tear. In the volume scan, the retina is not very clear, to be honest, as no averaging was used in the volume scan mode. In a case of regmatogenous retinal detachment, relatively clear OCT image can be obtained using line mode. This is because averaging technique was used here. These are the images of retinal degeneration. You can clearly observe vitreous adhesion or vitreous traction to the retinal degeneration. This is a case with vasoproliferative proliferative tumor in young patient. Probably OCT images are impossible to obtain using conventional OCT machines. But even with silverstone, focusing of such relatively high tumor seemed difficult. While in case of Coats disease, with pathology of small height, better images can be obtained. Finally, I would like to show some interesting findings in eyes with congenital X-linked retinal schesis, CXLRS, which is well known as early onset retinal degenerative disease seen in predominantly male. The responsible gene of this disease is identified as RS1 gene, which encodes retinal schesis. It is believed to function as cell-to-cell -cell adhesion in the retina. Therefore, if the function of retinal secretion is compromised, the retinal cells cannot stick together 
and cause retinal ascesis. It is already reported that in the macula, ascesis is observed in ganglion cell layer, in a nuclear layer, and outer nuclear layers. These are the images taken by Silverstone. If we look at the posterior pole more closely, schisis can be seen in inner nuclear layer and also outer nuclear layers. Let's look at peripheral retinal schisis by Silverstone. By scanning from posterior to the anterior, you can observe schisis both in inner and outer retina. As can be seen in these magnified images, retinal schisis is seen both in inner nuclear layer and ganglion cell layer. Also, it appears that there is traction to the inner wall. This is the feral eye of the same patient. Retinal schisis can be seen both in inner nuclear layer and ganglion cell layer as well. These findings are difficult to observe by conventional OCT machines. In summary, Silverstone is a ultra-wide field from this camera with capability of acquiring red-free colloidal FA autofluorescence ICG images and most importantly, SSOCT images. It is easy to use and good for observation of vitro retinal interface anywhere in the retina, especially in the peripheral retina. I believe Silverstone is especially useful in exploring so far unidentified pathology in the peripheral retina, which could not have been possible by previous conventional OCT machines. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Kusaka. Please turn on the video. Dr. Kusaka showed us the silverstone functions and many case images by various OCT scan types. I hope you all enjoyed the wonderful presentation. Now, Dr. Kusaka will answer questions that were sent during the presentation. Dr. Kusaka, please. Yes, uh, the first question is, uh, were you able to obtain OCT scan in most of peripheral part? And any difficult cases for peripheral scans? And the, my answer for the first question is, uh, yes, I was. I was able to obtain OCT scans uh, pretty easily, uh, wherever you can visualize the fundus by ultra-wide field camera. So by changing the scan where, uh, where you want to scan, uh, the scanning is uh, very easy. And this, for the second question, any difficult cases, um, it, as I mentioned, uh, in the especially in the peripheral retina with uh, like a high tumor with a height, a very high tumor, it was difficult to uh, obtain uh, beautiful scans in such cases. And for the second question, uh, ret oh, the next question is uh, retinal schisis OCT movie was amazing. Thank you very much. Did peripheral uh, OCTs can affect your treatment decision? Uh, yes, uh, it's more or less uh, because we thought in some patient that there was some traction to the uh, inner wall. Um, <clears throat> sometimes I do inner wall retinectomy in such cases, but uh, not only by the um, 
uh, findings by the uh, silver stone, we decide surgery, but uh, we think of course the visual acuity and other factors for decision. But as I think the presence of traction is that we want to remove it. <laughs> so yeah, that maybe that moves me a little bit toward the decision of surgery. Yes. Dr. Saka. Yes. Sorry, it's time is coming. Oh, sorry. So, yeah. Thank you again, Dr. Saka, for answering questions and a great presentation. Please turn off the video. Okay then. Here is Dr. Chowdhury as our next speaker. Dr. Chowdhury is the medical director of Vitreous Retina Macular Specialist of Toronto and affiliated at University of Toronto and Cleveland Clinic Canada. He has served on the board of director at American Society of Retina Specialists and Canadian Retina Society. Dr. Chowdhury will give us a presentation, Clinical Utility of Multimodality UWF Imaging with Peripheral OCT. So please join me in welcome, welcoming Dr. Chowdhury. Dr. Chowdhury, please introduce yourself. Welcome everybody, I'm Dr. Nathan Chowdhury from Toronto, Canada, and excited to share my experience with the unique Silverstone with everyone. Welcome everyone, I'm Dr. Nitin Chowdhury of the Vitreous Retina Macula Specialist of Toronto, and I'd like to thank Optos for the opportunity to present on clinical utility of multimodality ultra-wide field imaging with peripheral OCT. Over the last two decades, we've seen an explosion and in an interest in peripheral ultra-wide field imaging. Everything from OCT to fluorescein angiography to ICG, we've pretty much seen it all and the number of publications has been growing over the years. A few years ago, a number of us from international academic centers got together and put together a classification and guidelines for wide field imaging. Our group was focused on trying to find a universal definition for wide field and ultra wide field imaging. Our consensus study proposed the following nomenclature that wide field be referred to as a single capture image centered on the fovea and capturing the retina in all four quadrants posterior to and including the vortex vein ampullae, as seen here with the green circle. Ultra wide field was proposed to be a single capture view of the retina in the far periphery in all four quadrants, as seen with the blue circle. And ultimately, we hope that the word panretinal could be reserved for single capture images, 360 degrees aura to aura view of the retina. Now, a number of techniques have been studied and published on how to capture peripheral OCT. This approach, for example, steered imaging, involves moving the laser head in the direction of the pathology with the patient's cooperation. Obviously, a lot of cooperation is required. It does require a significant amount of time and can be quite technically challenging, reserved largely for skilled photographers or technicians. Another approach that we've published on involves using the internal fixation light which involves directing the patient's gaze using the internal fixation light and migrating slowly outward towards the mid and far periphery with the attempts of capturing the OCT of the pathology in question. Obviously, this can be limited based on the range of the device as well as more challenging and almost impossible in monocular patients. So these techniques have had some significant limitations. Steered imaging, as mentioned, does require, and patient, require patient cooperation. It can yield substantially beautiful images that are useful clinically, as seen here in the case of this vascular lesion that was imaged with the Optos California. Taking a series of images, series of OCTs, and montaging them together is another way of achieving larger, wide-field OCT scans of the periphery. This is significantly time consuming. We've also published on this approach and it involves registering the OCT line scans to the ultra wide field or pseudo color images. Of course, it is very technically challenging, time consuming, and for routine clinical practice, just not that practical. 
Another approach that's been published upon by Yoshimura's group involved using a trial frame and a 20 diopter lens, thereby allowing an expanded view of a single frame of an OCT capture. As seen here in figure A, that's the native capture, and then approximately 200% increased area of imaging using this 20 diopter lens worn by the patient. And you can see the same areas here highlighted in yellow. And we can see that that does give us that substantial increase in field of view. Over time, we've seen an increase in the length of B scans that OCT devices have offered. Starting from three millimeters in the early days of time domain, we've gone to nine millimeters, 12 millimeters, and now with the new Opto Silverstone, we've gone to 23.5 millimeter line scans, which are substantial in being able to provide us a wider field of view. So enter the novel integrated ultra wide field imaging and OCT platform. It's a mouthful, but really speaks to the benefits and the novel integrated advantages that the Opto Silverstone offers. It's a swept source OCT device operating at 1050 nanometers. It's a multimodal device doing everything from autofluorescence to ICG and peripheral as well as macular OCT. The OCT line scans are registered to the ultra wide field image. We have the option of a 23 millimeter line scan of which when two montage together can officially give you an aura to aura field of view. There's no steering required by the technician. There's no montaging required. There's no fixation light navigation required. You can see here in this video, our technician, a uh, very skilled operator, but you don't really need a skilled operator for this type of imaging with this device because it really is pretty simple. It's drag and drop and drag the line scan over the pathology of interest to obtain your OCT of choice. So a couple of years ago now, we started a study once we did acquire the device to describe the feasibility and clinical utility of peripheral OCT imaging in retinal diseases using this device. So we have a device like this now that can do many things. How helpful is it in a clinical setting? This was a prospective consecutive case series performed at our clinical site here in Toronto. We had 125 eyes with 38 different retinal pathologies, everything from the medical to surgical variety, including retinal detachments, retinoschisis, vein occlusions, retinal, retinitis pigmentosa, etc. Our methods included analyzing these particular eyes. All these patients underwent SLO swept source based imaging of the posterior pole, the mid periphery, or the far periphery, depending on the nature of the referral. So these were all consecutive referrals sent in for various pathologies, uh, and the area of interest was subsequently imaged. These patients had pseudocolor imaging as well as autofluorescence imaging. The ultra wide field six millimeter line scan and six millimeter volume scan was applied to the pathology of interest. And then a six millimeter HD volume scan or a 23 millimeter extended OCT line scan was also optional for the photographers to use at their discretion. And the main outcome measure here was to assess the accessibility of the peripheral pathology and then the impact of the OCT on clinical decision making. So really, can we get to these pathologies? Can, can the device reach the pathology of interest? And then when it does and we get a quality image, is it useful? This was the breakdown of some of the pathologies by location. They were pretty balanced in the mid and the far periphery. There was a few that were across different regions of the retina from the posterior pole and mid periphery or mid periphery and far periphery. So relatively balanced on the mid and the far periphery in terms of types of cases. So looking at these eyes more carefully, we can see there was about 125 eyes that were assessed. Uh, nine eyes were excluded because of incomplete image acquisition, much like other devices, but less so with the Silverstone. The patient's disposition and their ability to sit for imaging does factor into it, less so because we have the ability to drag and drop an OCT line scan. The average age was 54 years, and about 69% of these patients had peripheral-only pathologies. And the addition of peripheral OCT, in addition to a clinical exam, did impact clinical decision-making in about 84% of cases. That is, allowing the patient or provider to actually determine whether the patient 
It's lesion needed treatment, surgery, laser, injection, etc. So here are some real world applications of peripheral OCT. I think you know this is really where the money is, is looking at how do we use this type of technology in practice. Uh, the, the technology has been out now for some time. This is a 25 year old male that was referred for a peripheral lesion. You can see here in the super temporal quadrant that there is a pigmented lesion with some peripheral atrophy. And here's the OCT video of this area. The beauty of the device is we are able to get real-time video and you can see that there are some schesis type changes. This ended up being a retinal tuft, a cystic tuft, and the patient did have photopsias and as a result laser retinopexy was applied. And I think here in this final frame below you can actually appreciate some of the vitreous architecture which is being improved upon by Optos in subsequent software iterations. This is a 28-year-old male that was referred for vision loss. Now, it's not very common to see young patients come in for surgical pathologies involving the posterior pole. So looking at this pseudo-color image, there's some white without pressure, there's some peripheral cystoid generation. But I'll draw your attention to the autofluorescence image. And there is a teardropped shaped area of hyper-autofluorescence with a central area of hypo-autofluorescence. And here it is outlined for you right there with the central area of a hypoautofluorescence shown with the star. And so when I saw this patient, he had, a, he had some subretinal fluid in the macula, and it wasn't really clear where the break was located. And this is where we've been more and more utilizing this device, which is for these types of scenarios where we need to do a search and detect of retinal breaks. So here's the video for this patient. As you can see, we did a raster line scan over the suspected area and you can see that there's intraretinal fluid and there's also here this central focal break. So this patient actually had a largely posterior pole and somewhat mid-peripheral retinal detachment that had been sort of lingering along and we were able to locate the break. He had a pneumatic retinopexy which was done with an injection of gas followed by laser and he did very well. Here's this patient again. Now we're looking on the far right of the screen. You'll see the serial OCT line scans, 23 millimeters in length, going through the gas bubble up at 12 o'clock, and then going through the posterior pole, showing the resolution of the subretinal fluid. And on the far left, you can see the original retinal break with subretinal fluid. So really, the beauty of this approach is that not only does the 1050 nanometer wavelength get through gas, but we can actually serially follow our patients over time, not only to detect the original area in question, but also their response to therapy, particularly surgical interventions when performed in the office and or in the operating room. This is a 55-year-old Asian male that was sent for second opinion. He's had multiple surgeries in his left eye. This was a hand motions eye with chronic retinal detachment. He had a number of surgeries and was very frustrated and he was primarily really concerned about his good eye and what the likelihood of his, of his right eye having a similar situation develop. OCT imaging of this patient's left eye reveals obviously chronic detachment type changes, subretinal fluid, intraretinal cystic changes, and many irregular retinal morphologies, particularly in the area of the sclerochroidal boundary. Here's his right eye, and at first glance, the pseudocolor image is relatively unremarkable with the exception of some hyperpigmentation at about 8 o'clock. But if you look closely with the OCT as we did, you will actually see and appreciate that there are areas of vitreous as well as inner retinal schesis that are present throughout this patient's posterior pole. And this may have been the nidus for his retinal detachment in the left eye. So while no intervention was warranted immediately in this patient's right eye, it is a helpful baseline image to follow over time to confirm and observe if a possible retinal detachment or schesis detachment develops in this patient. Here's a 53-year-old female that was referred for a choroidal lesion. You can see a, pig, a variable pigmented lesion up there at the supratemporal location and this patient was referred in for this, for this problem. Now the beauty is for those of us that do examine and see choroidal lesions, whether they're choroidal melanomas or nevi, 
Dragging an OCT out to the periphery with the Silverstone has made life a lot easier versus the traditional method of trying to navigate the patient and navigate the OCT to the area of interest. So here's the Silverstone peripheral OCT of this patient. We can appreciate that there is a choroidal lesion, of course. We know the pigmentation is variable. We can appreciate subretinal fluid and the near-infrared reflectance images below. And this patient was subsequently referred in to the local ocular oncology specialist. The autofluorescence image there shows hyperautofluorescence, suggestive again of subretinal fluid, which we were able to confirm on OCT. And so, you know, from an ocular oncology perspective, this can be a game changer insofar as being able to measure the thickness and the height of choroidal nevi, choroidal tumors, or suspicious lesions, and then subsequently getting information about subretinal fluid and, and the like. And now this is really the way we approach all of our choroidal lesions. We will definitely get a series of line scans over the area of interest and ensure that we're not missing any possible subretinal fluid. Here's a lady that I saw last week. I love this case as challenging as it was. She's a 58 year old female uh, who I was following for one year post retinal detachment repair. She was doing great prior to this presentation. You can see she's got a few areas of retinal atrophy and laser scars from prior procedures. She has had a vitrectomy and presented with counting uh, fingers, macula off detachment. And one of the challenges in these folks who are a blonde fundus in appearance is finding the break and what's the next step. She had already seen another provider locally on call who had suggested a buckle with oil and obviously, you know, not necessarily an unreasonable approach, but can we do better? That's the question. So here we are scanning all quadrants with our silver stone, looking at the retinal detachment, looking at the height, trying to localize and find the break of interest in order to determine our surgical plan. If it's an inferior detachment only with an inferior break, our plan would be something different than if it's a single superior break that we can possibly deal with in the office. So here's a high resolution image of what we found to be the break that was the source of her detachment. And here's the OCT. It's a very tiny break, very hard to find. We spent a good amount of time finding it. We confirmed it on OCT. She then subsequently underwent an in-office pneumatic retinopexy. Again, this is a vitrectomized eye. So, and this is her today, actually. So we had her one week post-op, uh, post-procedure. Her retina's attached, she's 2040. The break is healing. You can see the bubble up there. And ultimately, you know, this was a time-saving and game-saving event for her, and she was very appreciative, and it was all done with a little bit of hand handiwork in the office using the Silverstone. So really, in summary, you know, peripheral OCT has, is, facilitates an expanded analysis of the retinal periphery, unlike what we've ever been able to do before. It's relatively straightforward from a technician or photographer standpoint, literally drag and drop. The pathology is requiring surgical decisions, particularly in our study with retinal holes, tears, tufts, lattice, detachments. Those are particularly benefiting from OCT in the periphery. Combining ultra wide field imaging and peripheral OCT offers a more comprehensive approach to diagnosis and management. And ultimately, this approach of using peripheral OCT helps to correctly identify and detect lesions which may otherwise be misdiagnosed or missed altogether due to their size, as we saw with this last retinal detachment patient. We'll open it up to discussion, and I appreciate your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Chowdhury. Please turn on your video. Dr. Chowdhury explained the importance of capturing OCT images especially peripheral area. I hope you all enjoyed this wonderful presentation. Now, Dr. Chowdhury will answer questions that were sent during the presentation. Dr. Chowdhury, please. Thank you. Um, so, you know, a number of questions have been coming through, a few of which I've answered to the chat at large. But I think, you know, one of the questions that comes up over and over again is, is how to use this uh, device in a busy clinical practice. And what's the utility overall and how much time does it take to find, you know, lesions of interest? I think all of those questions really are very critical, particularly in today's world, especially with the backlog with COVID pandemic. 
And I think the singular way to challenge, to approach that is to say that, you know, our technicians and photographers are physician extenders. They work as an extension of all of us uh, providers. And so I spend a good amount of my time spending, teaching my staff um, about different pathologies, where to look, what these pathologies mean, what are the signs that we're looking for, where breaks tend to happen, so that they're quite educated as patients are referred in and pathologies are being imaged, that they themselves have some degree of autopilot in being able to search and detect properly and make an efficient use of our time, the patient's time and the overall journey of the patient. So I think, you know, just leaving the device in the hand of a technician, they may, you know, without any education, they may spend a lot of time finding and looking for things that may not be meaningful. But I think providing some education to them is quite valuable in the long run. And that's how we've been able to build our practice and also build our search and uh, discovery of the peripheral retina over the years. There were some questions that came up about myopes and imaging myopes. Obviously, this is a big challenge in, in retinal medicine, particularly in certain parts of the world like Asia. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the challenges with myopes has always been the eyes are very long, of course, and you'll get image doubling or backscattering because the zero delay line is so low. So one of the beauties of the Silverstone, which we've experienced, and we get a lot of high myope referrals that are going for refractive surgery, LASIK, PRK, refractive lens exchange, et cetera. So they have large axial lengths and interesting pathologies in their myopic eyes. The 23 millimeter line scan has been very helpful in that regard. You're getting a singular large line scan of the entire posterior pole, which will often pick up nerve fiber layer species, pick up subtle areas of vitreous traction or vitreous macular traction, even outside, outside the macula. Uh, and so that line scan actually has been very meaningful. So I think as we continue to evolve our approach, as the software evolves, as the device evolves, we're going to see that there'll be a larger and larger catchment of utility of devices like this in a real world setting. Dr. Chowdhury, sorry to interrupt you, but time is coming. So great thank great. you again, Dr. Chowdhury, for answering thank questions you. and for the great presentation. Thank you. Before closing this webinar, I would like to have a comments from Dr. Kusaka and Dr. Chowdhury. Dr. Kusaka and Dr. Chowdhury, please turn on your video. Thank you. Dr. Kusaka and Dr. Chowdhury, do you have any question or comments to each other presentation? Yes. So I'd like to, I'd like to ask Dr. Saka a question. Uh, mm -hmm. Excellent presentation, of course. You know, as usual, I think you have a very unique patient population in this part of the world versus in North America. And I think one of the questions which came up in the chat, but it's also you know very useful, is what is the general age range from a pediatric perspective where you have found the device helpful? Because children otherwise have a difficult time sitting for imaging. Now you have an all-in-one device. How do you use it in the pediatric population? Yeah, that's a very good question. Excellent question. I like uh, Optos uh, very much. Uh, the major reason is uh, it's very good for pediatric patient. The, the, uh, I think the youngest age we could take uh, Optos image was I think two or two and a half. Uh, if the patient is female, that may be better. <laughs> but uh, if yeah, for also um, for the FA, I I will publish a paper in the Retina uh, in the up upcoming issue. But we um, ask the patient to intake uh, orally the fluorescence, and after five minutes uh, we can take beautiful pictures. But that's only possible by uh, Optos. Uh, because of the high, um, the, the um, <clears throat> sensor is very nice, and the the uh, we can take picture in 0.4 second, so those are good uh, um, uh, features for uh, pediatric pra pediatric practice. Excellent. And uh, I have a question for uh, Dr. Chowdhury. Um, uh, uh, we agree, we, probably we agree that uh, Optos Silverstone is already highly potential machine, but uh, what um, is your wish list in addition to the current uh, capabilities, uh, one feature you, you would like to add? 
That's a great question. I think, you know, as specialists, we always have a wish list. We always shoot for the perfect, uh, perfect device. We're getting there. We're nearly there. I think with the Silverstone, what I think now is what, what our feedback has been to the company and what's being worked on and is almost actually ready for a release is getting more vitreous detail. Um, I think that that's going to be the next frontier in retinal imaging. We've done a great job getting good retinal images, good sclerochoroidal images, particularly in myopes. We can even see with swept source, like mm. uh, we can see orbital bone. Um, but I think getting more vitreous detail would be helpful, particularly in, again, pediatric population, people with vitro-retinal interface disease. And of course, the ultimate you know, purveyor in our practice, retinal detachment. Thank you. Sorry to cut in, but uh, sorry to cut into your wonderful discussion. But thank you again for having great discussion and the presentations. We also appreciate all attendees for joining this webinar today. In our webinar, we introduced the clinical experience and the utility of Silverstone. If you wish to know more about Silverstone, please contact to our authorized distributor in your countries. We will promptly respond to all your inquiries. Before we close today's webinar, we would like to announce the Congress information for audience from Asia Pacific region. Nikon will be a sponsor of the Asia Pacific Academy of the Ophthalmology Congress in September. We will have a virtual booth and a symposium. Our distributor in China is going to have a booth and event in August on a Chinese Congress of Ophthalmology Society. Also, our distributor in Indonesia is going to have a private symposium in September on the Peludami Virtual Scientific Meeting. Please look at these Congress booths and join the private symposium or events. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey and we would, we would appreciate if you would complete that and provide your feedback. On behalf of Optos, Nikon, and our presenters, thank you for joining us today and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.